on mental and social health issues, which may largely go unrecognized. And now as we pour most of our resources and energy towards containment of this disease and critical care, saving lives from acute complications, which is the primary goal now, should we be considering and preparing for the secondary goals? Today we have as panelists to discuss these issues, two eminent healthcare professionals. Dr. Olu Jimmy Koka and Dr. Deji Oyebodi. And I'll just give you a brief rundown of their resumes. Dr. Olu Jimmy Koka is a surgeon and he qualified and he's the CEO of the Lagoon Hospitals Group. Nigeria. He qualified from the College of Medicine of the University of Ibadan and completed his internship there also. He had his specialist surgical training in the United Kingdom and his basic training in Greater Manchester and his higher surgical training in South Yorkshire based around the Sheffield University Teaching Hospitals. He was appointed Senior Lecturer in Surgery at Northern General Hospital and the University of Sheffield in January 1999. And in November of the same year, he joined uh, the Doncaster NHS Trust as a consultant general surgeon. However, in 2011, January, he left the UK for a sabbatical in Lagos, Nigeria, to lead the surgical strategy at Hygieia, Nigeria. And he was appointed as the chief of surgery at the Lagoon Hospitals. He also worked in close collaboration with Quality Improvement Unit to achieve the GCI accreditation for the Lagoon Hospitals in 2011. After his two year sabbatical, he resigned from the UK National Health Service in December 2012 and took up appointment as group advisor and chief of surgery at the Lagoon Hospitals. He's a board member of the Society for Quality Health in Nigeria and the chairman, SQHN Technical Committee that is responsible for the production and implementation of accreditation standards for Nigerian hospitals. He chairs the COVID-19 outbreak response team at Lagoon Hospitals and has profound technical assistance and has provided profound technical assistance to different regional and national organizations in preparation for the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Dr. Jimmy Coker. And our next panelist is Dr. Deji Oyebodi. Dr. Oyebodi is a senior forensic psychiatrist who works for the East London Foundation Trust. And he has worked as a forensic psychiatrist as well as deputy medical director for the trust from 2007 to 2018. He continues to work for the trust as responsible officer for revalidation and relicensing of doctors. He has a diploma in criminology a Master's of Philosophy in Psychiatry, and is a Fellow of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Dr. Everybody has previously been Medical Director of South West London and St. George's Mental Health Services, NHS Trust, and Clinical Director of Forensic Mental Health Services. 
in the same trust. He has also been a senior policy advisor for the Department of Health. He has been a member of the Parole Board for England and Wales and medical member of several independent review panels. Additionally, he has been appointed NHS England, London, Regional Appraiser for Responsible Officers and the Department of Health Senior Medical Officers and Responsible Officers. He has completed reports for immigration cases using the Istanbul Protocol as well as being appointed to the list of expert witnesses who can be instructed by the General Medical Council. The format that this webinar will take will be presentations, maybe about 10 minutes presentations by each of the panelists. And then we'll have questions and discussions. We'd also like you, uh, to your active participation, the active participation of all our attendees and participants. This is very important to us. And as such, we would encourage you to please send in your questions during the presentation by typing in the by typing in the Q&A chat box. Your questions will be analyzed, collated, and answered during the Q&A session after both presentations. My name is Yabo Kudaya. I'm a doctor, a pediatrician, and the CEO at Lifeline Children's Hospital. I will be the moderator for this webinar. Thank you. And so to start the webinar, I think we will call on our first on our first panelist, Dr. Jimmy Coker, who will tell us about the critical aspect care and other important things regarding to COVID-19. Dr. Jimmy Coker, please. Okay, Dr. Kudaya, thank you very much. Uh, today we're talking about COVID-19 infection that is caused by a virus called the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's a beta coronavirus that was first identified in November 2019 in the Wuhan province, uh, in Wuhan, Hubei province in China. And in uh, it was declared a pandemic by the, uh, by the WHO in March 2020. It has ravaged most countries and it is spread by person-to-person -person contact. Um, it is higher, it is, uh, the, the, the disease is uh, quite ferocious in people with associated illnesses and in the elderly. The mode of spread is usually through respiratory droplets, hence the importance of physical distancing of at least two meters. Um, recent evidence of possible airborne infection with implications for the universal use of face masks by everyone, both inside and outside, uh, particularly in crowded cases, has come to fore, which is the reason why WHO and our own NCDC has now advised that people should wear some form of mask to cover their noses and mouths. Uh, it doesn't have to be a surgical face mask, a cloth mask will do. The viral, that is the, the amount of virus that is transmissible uh, in an individual with the infection is highest soon after the illness compared with later on in the disease. Part of the difficulty we have with this infection is the fact that about 6.4% of people who are infected with this condition may not have any symptoms or they may indeed uh, spread the 
infection even before they develop symptoms, usually within the first three days of illness. The time of infection to the appearance of symptoms is called the incubation period. And in this condition, it is usually about 14 days, but majority of people will develop symptoms within four to five days after exposure. There has been socio-political and economic consequences of this disease, particularly in the early stages. One could argue that this was a failure of world leadership. But at a time, the stock markets were in meltdown. It then resulted in a tiff between Saudi Arabia and Russia with a subsequent collapse in the price of oil, which with the attendant consequences had adversely affected countries like ourselves. We've had to revise our budget downwards. There are other issues associated with this illness, the foremost of which is the level at which one does testing for the virus, the amount of people that need to be tested, when they should be tested. At the moment, the incidence or and severity in sub-Saharan Africa is not as profound as it has been in the West and in America. And there are several theories that have been attributed to this, foremost of which is the coincidence of BCG vaccination with the areas of low intensity and ferocity. Um, as alluded to earlier, patients may become infective even before they show signs and symptoms of the disease. In about 80% of patients, the disease is very mild or moderate and it is only in 20% that the disease is quite severe. Uh, there has been no deaths recorded in mild to moderate cases, and that is quite reassuring indeed. The features of the illness include fever, which is most prominent, because about 95% of people who have COVID-19 infection will have a fever. And it is usually a, fever, a high fever on the range of 38.5 degrees and above. So if you have a cold and you think that you have COVID-19, if you don't have any fever, it is unlikely that you have COVID-19. Next to figure, fever is fatigue and a dry cough, persistent dry cough. Uh, that occurs in more than two thirds of patients. About half of the patients will complain of loss of appetite and muscle pain. Shortness of breath is another predominant symptom. Uh, intriguingly, some patients also present complaining for the first time of loss of smell or taste. And a third of patients may present to the doctors that way. Other symptoms are nausea and diarrhea. With, uh, diarrhea. Headaches can also be a problem. We still don't know why predominantly men are more affected than women in a factor of about two to one. Adults, that is the very elderly, infants and people with comorbidity also fare worse with this illness. There are some patients who present with severe symptoms, particularly pneumonia. The patients may also have severe reduction in their ability to exchange oxygen in both lungs. Uh, under normal circumstances, one would have referred to this as the adult respiratory distress syndrome. But a lot of the data emanating both, both from, from France and the States show that this is not the typical adult respiratory distress syndrome that one is familiar with. Cardiac problems may occur multi-organ failure also occurs whereby the kidneys and the rest of the organs fail with resultant death. It is important to appreciate also that other conditions may coexist with COVID-19. So for healthcare practitioners in particular, uh, somebody may still have appendicitis 
and they have COVID-19. There was the celebrated case of the lady who was pregnant with COVID-19, but the baby was delivered, and unfortunately, she passed away in the UK recently. It's also important that other, other conditions, like the simple flu, uh, cold and catar, have not gone on sabbatical. They are still very much around. And so it's important to understand that not ev every cough or runny nose is as a result of COVID-19. So best to speak to your doctor if in doubt. We make the diagnosis of COVID-19 through a nasopharyngeal swab, and you would probably have seen some of this on TV. And the swab is, uh, what is then done is that the viral DNA is extracted, the viral RNA is extracted from the swab so that one can determine the viral load of the patient. That indicates infectivity. Uh, another test that can be done is a blood test to check the antibody of the person. Now, the antibody, a positive antibody, occurs in about 93% of cases. And the positive antibody indicates that the person has mounted an immune response to the virus. Previously, we thought that this conferred lifelong immunity. But data coming out of South Korea now show that reinfection can occur with this virus, which is quite troubling. So as of now, we really do not know what level of immunity is conferred following survival from COVID-19 infection. Prevention, as they say, is better than cure. So protection against contracting this virus is very important. And the most effective way of doing so is with physical distancing. And physical distancing is to avoid contact with an infected person by staying away, giving a radius of about two meters. Note that I did not say social distancing, which is the common parlance. Uh, because really, COVID-19 does not mean we should emotionally distance ourselves from our friends and relatives. So it is physical distancing. The next important thing is hand hygiene, preferably with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. If there is no soap and water available, then alcohol-based hand sanitizers will suffice. It is important to avoid touching one's eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands because of the risk of transferring the virus to one's organs. Respiratory hygiene is also very important. And what do I mean by respiratory hygiene? If you, if you want to cough, you should get a tissue paper, cough into the tissue paper, or sneeze into the tissue paper, discard the tissue paper, and wash your hands. Should you perchance not have access to tissue paper, then you can use the inner part of your elbow to cover your nose and your mouth to sneeze or to cough. It is important to regularly disinfect areas, particularly worktops, door handles, and other areas that we constantly touch. It is preferable to refrain from visiting affected areas. But if you have to do so, then you need to self-isolate for two weeks. Sadly, this was one of the problems we had at the beginning of this illness, when a lot of people who returned to the country did not self-isolate as they should have. And this also contributed to the spread of the illness. Lastly is the use of face masks. And I had alluded to that earlier, that now really, and it is unlikely that we will get rid of this virus this year until a vaccine is available for herd immunity. It is therefore likely that a new normal for us may be that we will need to wear face masks when we are outside in crowded areas, supermarkets, and other places. You will all be under lockdown at the moment. And I know that there are economic consequences to this, and people have been uh, discomforted from this. But there are important reasons for the lockdown. 
The lockdown is an extreme form of physical distancing. And the reason why the lockdown is prescribed is to, is to reduce the R value. What do I mean by the R value? The R value is the number of persons that an infected person will go on to infect. So usually about three to four. So one infected person infects about three to four. Then each of those four people infect another four. And before you know what's happening, we have 64 people infected from one person. So that R value in that case is four. Insofar as the R value is less than one, then the disease will not spread. So to reduce the R value, extreme physical distancing in the form of lockdown is done. It also affords healthcare systems to develop their processes. And I would use Lagos for an as an example. Uh, we, the the COVID-19 made landfall in, in Nigeria on the 27th of February. At that time, we only had one isolation center in Yaba with 110 beds and no ICU facilities. As we speak today, we have almost 600 beds in the five isolation centers available to us in Lagos. The Yaba Isolation Center now has five ICU beds in addition to the 110 beds. But Gada Isolation Center has 200 beds and 10 and has capacity for 10 ICU beds. Unico Isolation Center has 110 beds with the capacity for 10 ICU beds. The Luth Isolation Ward has 60 isolation beds with a capacity for six ICU beds. And the Landmark Isolation Center, which is the newest of the lot, also has 82 beds with a capacity for 10 ICU. So really you will see that within the period of four to six weeks, there was the opportunity to try and ramp up the capacity for us to be able to accommodate uh, this disease should the exponential rise occur and when it does. It's also important to appreciate that lockdowns work most effectively if they are done along with extensive contract tracing and aggressive testing. That testing is also important so that we can identify infected people and quarantine appropriately. Currently, there are no vaccines. Um, management is fairly, at the moment, there is no cure. There are a number of drugs that have been looked at. Remedis, Remedisfa, which is an antiviral agent, is the one that currently holds the most promise, but it is still at an experimental stage. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have been discussed, but there are conflicting reports as to the usefulness because they also cause harm in some instances. Um, I would not talk very much about ventilators because I had alluded to the ICU capacity. However, it is important to note that ventilators are not like buying cars. If you say you get 10 ventilators, then you need at least five intensivists to be able to look after these five ventilators that will be attached to patients. Uh, those, five, those five ventilators will also require at least 15 trained ICU nurses and other support staff. So there is a whole infrastructure that supports a ventilator. And just talking about ventilators in isolation does not help. What about the prognosis of this illness? Uh, about the 80% that I spoke about will usually recover between two to three weeks of the illness. People with severe illnesses, take, it takes about four to eight weeks to recover. And the take home message, I think we all need to understand and appreciate in spite of all the scare stories that we have heard, is that should 100 people develop COVID-19 infection, 80 of these people will only need physical distancing, rest, and appropriate measures for a very, fairly bad flu infection. 20 people sadly will need to be admitted to hospital and they usually will be people with co other comorbid infections like diabetes, hypertension, renal problems, 
heart problems, the very elderly, uh, people who are immunosuppressed, i.e. Their, their immunity has been suppressed, like HIV infection and sickle cell anemia. Of those 20, five would require ventilation, and unfortunately, three out of those five will die. So a at the moment, if, if, if one can avoid ventilating the patients, then it is very, very important. I will stop here and pass back to our moderator, Dr. Kudaya, and we'll be happy to entertain questions later. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jimmy Coker. I'm sure there must be a lot of questions that will um, come forth from, from uh, your talk. Thank you very much. You did mention that um, you alluded to the fact that, and try to explain to us that lockdown is inevitable. It is what we have to do now. And it's, well, it's one of the measures that we must undertake to make sure that we beat this disease. Now, that then ties in with what we are going to ask Dr. Deji Oyebody to talk about. Because a lot of us have been under lockdown, and worldwide there are over 2 billion people that have been in some form of lockdown since this started. In fact, this has been described as the world's largest psychological experience. And so I'd like to bring on Dr. Dejo Ibadi at this stage, who's going to explain to us the effects that this that lockdown and COVID-19 in general may have on our mental well-being, may have on social health, and the things that we can start to put in place, Dr. Ibadi. For those, for those who do not know me, I should say that although I have worked in the UK for many years, I've worked in the UK for many years, I grew up in the grounds of psychiatric hospital, Yaba, from about the age of 11 years, then referred to as Yaba Pausi. And that's the stigma that we had with mental illness that people didn't want to refer to the asylum, so they call it a Pausi. When traveling from Lagos mainland to Lagos Island is on your left, and that's why it's called a policy. My father worked there as a psychiatric nurse and became the chief nurse. I went to medical school to try and understand the working of the human mind because of my experience in a hospital. After qualifying as a doctor, I did national service at the hospital. I also worked at the neuropsychiatric hospital, Arrow, before coming to the UK. So my training roots are from Nigeria, and I've also endeavored to do reality check, which I'll enunciate later. Cor coronavirus is an unknown disease, as I've been said. There's no cure or treatment at the moment. The problem is that over the years of civilization, human beings have had, by and large, been able to control our lives and destiny. In this case, we seem not to have con lost control, and so have not found a cure. Hence, we're globally frightened and stressed, we are understandably psychological, these are understandable psychological reactions for which we should not feel guilty. I will now try and address some of the psychological and social impacts on all of us. Firstly, social isolation. This seems to be an appropriate approach at present from the evidence and facts available. It has been helpful for our safety as evidence across the globe has shown. However, there are consequences. Most important is the loneliness and isolation it entails. These feelings are normal and expected, so we should not feel bad when we feel that way. We have all been used to our freedom, doing exactly what we wanted to do, part of our civil liberties that we have taken for granted until now. The human animal is by instinct sociable and gregarious, so we are being asked to go against the grain. However, we now have a lot of time to reflect 
and be introspective. This means that things that have been mundane in the past now come to the fore. For example, cough and touching one's face that we all took for granted, we now have to become more concerned about. We need to try and be objective and have a reality check. We need to step back and think about the clinical symptoms we experienced prior to COVID-19. We still coughed and touched our faces, so we do not need to fear or overreact. Cough is normal if the fluid goes the wrong way in our throats. Keep washing your hands and regularly with soap and water to make touching your face safe. We must not forget another consequence of social isolation. The economic effects on those who cannot work from home and need to go out on a daily basis to earn their income for the day. I will now go to look at the psychological symptoms we may be experiencing. I will look into anxiety, depression, and paranoia. Just to say that some of these symptoms occur on the day-to-day -day experience and stress occurs on the day-to-day -day experience. The concern is they go beyond the norm and are exacerbated. I've always said to my trainees when I had them, not anymore, now that I'm semi-retired, that there's nothing wrong with being anxious before examinations or depressed if failure sadly happens. The concerning thing is if the symptoms are severe or go on for too long, by that I mean a few days, not more than a week from my clinical experience. The symptoms we should be looking out for in generalized anxiety disorder are feeling anxious themselves. And this may suffer for some people that just have a regular headache because you're anxious. You are trembling, that means your hands are shaking, muscular tension, sweating, lightheadedness, palpitations. Suddenly you can feel your heart beating and most times the heart rate is, is faster. That's why you're noticing it. There'll be dizziness, epigastric discomfort, apprehension, that's worried about the future, misfortune, feeling on edge, difficulty concentrating. The comorbidity is in anxiety is increased alcohol consumption. Either used as tranquilization or sedation to deal with anxiety or fear, or to mask these as one may not want to appear weak to family and friends. COVID-19 COVID will also make us experience extreme reaction as a lot of people live on the day-to-day -day financing and now under extreme pressure because there's no daily income. May I say that these feelings are okay in the current climate. The world is fighting a pathogen that even the best brains in the world have so far not found a real solution. I've gone to depression. The symptoms we need to look out for are depressed mood itself. You don't feel the way you normally feel. You are lethargic, you're feeling low, loss of interest and enjoyment, reduced energy leading to fatigability and diminished activity, marked tiredness after only slight effort is common, reduced concentration and attention, disturbed sleep and diminished appetite. May I just say that, listening to Dr. Coca, some of these symptoms may occur in COVID, but what we need to be careful is to look at the constellation of symptoms. Because people who have COVID may feel very lethargic, very tired, but you look at the mood, it's a total number of symptoms, not just the isolated one. So don't get frightened. Then with paranoia, people are likely to become more suspicious of each other as fear and stress endanger paranoia. We begin to read meanings into mundane behavior activities by others. This is underpinned by fear of the unknown, which is COVID-19 at present. This does not mean that you are mentally ill or mad, as is said in common parlance. We have to watch against this. Remember the world is dealing with a severe and dangerous situation. Our psyche has to have a way of processing it. Otherwise, a real mental breakdown will occur. We just need to be cognizant of this reaction to the current situation and regularly do a reality check. For example, this is this person really persecuting me? Why am I suddenly having these thoughts? I would like to also touch on loss and bereavement. Sadly, some are likely to lose loved ones from COVID-19 infection. Depending on local arrangements, we may not be able to be with them when dying or attend their funerals, both of which are extremely important in some cultures. Some will therefore experience a deep feeling of loss and helplessness. There will be a fallout in the bereavement recovery. 
suddenly people who are used to family and friends sharing the loss with them in person will not be able to do so. The next best thing is video link, which, may, which many may not have access to. The anniversary will be affected by this lack of good initial grieving process. Then I'll talk about what I have termed emerging issues. Some of these are increased domestic violence, which have been reported in the UK. People are living on top of each other, sometimes annoying each other. We need to be patient and tolerant, appreciate each other's good qualities more. Increased suicide rates and parasuicidal behavior. By this, I mean attempted suicides of all types. A health worker in Italy reportedly killed herself after infection at work for fear of infecting her family. People are likely to lose their businesses and livelihoods. This could lead to extreme reactions. Coping strategies. Well, some have been suggested, some that have been suggested are organized IT links via face, FaceTime, Zoom, webinar, which we're doing, support those alone and or vulnerable, exercise one hour per day if possible, reading, and prayer for those whom it feels comforting. Some may require professional psychological help at some point. Please bear in mind that that is not a sign of weakness. This is no time to be talking about stigma. The world is dealing with an unprecedented incident, which no doubt will affect some adversely, psychologically, and emotionally. So please give yourself a chance to come out of it psychologically well balanced, with no lasting psychological damage. So please access it if you need it. I cannot be more specific about the type of treatment. It depends on the symptoms manifested. A judgment has to be made by the assessing clinician. However, government and healthcare services need to be ready for the psychological aftermath of COVID. Post-infection. There are now concerns about reinfection which Dr. Koka has alluded to, but looking at the facts, experts query if, these, if there are community reinfections, where these cases not properly treated in the first place, this makes the future quite concerning and bleak. My view is that only, we, all, we can only be globally reassured if a vaccine is developed, as has been suggested by advisors and scientists on the front line. I read in the press that Oxford University is stating a target of September 2020 for a vaccine. I have no inside information. We can only wish they and others racing to provide vaccine good luck. This is a global issue that requires solution from all world citizens. And to express our thanks, I would like to end on a positive note and raise our spirits in these very moments of all very stressed globally. Firstly, pandemics date to classic times from the Greeks and the Romans. Human beings have survived. We will survive. I think we should pause to express our thanks to health and social workers, many of whom will physically and emotionally be ex exhausted from the good care they are providing for us. Some most undoubtedly have a overriding sense of fear, which is understandable. Plus, their loved ones may be putting pressure on them to quit work at this time. We really appreciate what you're doing. I implore and urge you to not feel guilty about your emotional ex experiences. They are normal in the current circumstances. Many of us will feel the same in your position. We are grateful to you all. Please keep doing the good work. Finally, I would like to thank my wife, a palliative care nurse at the Royal Marsden Hospital who continues to go to work and has taken time to prove read this paper. She added the log bereavement section because of her clinical background. To Dr. Charlie Osiba, a chief in Canada, my mate, who I've spoken to daily since the COVID-19, he has provided useful advice on this talk and a reality check for me because of his regular contact with the Nigerian medical center. And I would also like to thank Dr. Kudaya, a moderator today, where, who, when I sent a sketch of a talk to her, raised the issue of health and social care workers, hence the paragraph on health and social care workers. I lord Emmanuel Champu for their Herculean efforts. God bless Dupe and Konya Ajayi and their EC crew for the gigantic efforts in delivering the best Nigerians can offer. This is what most of, our, most of us are made of. Thank you all for listening. And may the good Lord protect us all. Amen. Uh, Doctor, thank you very much, Dr. Um, DJ Yabadi. 
Um, I think we will now go into uh, question and answers. I'd like to encourage people who are joining us through Facebook. Uh, that sh they should please um, leave their questions in the question and answer section on Facebook. And we will endeavor to get them and answer them. A lot of people have joined us by Zoom, but I'm sure many, many more have joined us by Facebook. A few questions have, uh, have come to the fore. Um, one of them, and I, I think we'll pose questions for both uh, Drs. Koka and uh, Dr. Oyebody. For Dr. Oyebody, the COVID-19 lockdown, as we said, has been described as the largest psychological experience. Should we, as Nigerians, and all over the world, be thinking ahead so that we can treat the inevitable, invisible psychological wounds inflicted by COVID-19? Should our governments be working with mental health practitioners to develop guidelines and protocols? So that's uh, one question for you. I think we'll just take the questions you know, as they come. I think that the government should be developing guidelines with healthcare professionals of how we're going to deal with this. As far as I know, the Royal College of Psychiatrists is already helping the UK government. One thing which I didn't mention in my talk is that some people are also going to experience symptoms of post-traumatic sex disorder. Because it's a serious stress and we people are very fearful and they're going to relieve and re-experience re re the symptoms which will continue to make them anxious. And because we have no cure, there's a chance of reinfection it makes the chances of PTSD quite high. So the governments across the world should be getting themselves ready about providing psychological help for people post-COVID and for health and social care workers who are on the forefront now. And I know in the UK, that psychological help is available to okay. health and social care workers. Thank you. Another question is that, I don't know if Dr. Uh, uh, Jimmy Coker in, his hospital has experienced this. Again, the impact of COVID-19 on, on, on the psyche of healthcare workers, the overriding sense of fear, absenteeism, resignations. Some, some people have resigned because they've been pressurized by uh, family. And just the physical and the mental um, exhaustion. Dr. Koka, have you experienced anything like this? Yes, uh, thank you very much. We have indeed experienced things like that. Uh, the greatest was during the Ebola crisis when parents came from villages to remove their daughters to say, that's it, you're not doing nursing any longer. It's not been as bad with uh, COVID-19. I think part of that is because of the preparations that we have made. We have an isolation tent. We started screening people coming into our facilities. Immediately we had the first, the index case. We had locked all the other entrances to our facilities such that there is just the one entrance. So all of those measures have helped in reducing instances where these uh, cases can pass through. So that we, we, we try as much as possible to isolate these suspected cases. They are then seen by people with appropriate personal protective gears to you know, screen the patients and uh, re refer them to the IDH in Yaba, because currently the government uh, directive, both state and federal, is that private hospitals should not be treating COVID-19 cases. What I have found, however, 
is the profound effect that patients who lied to us and got in through, there were one or two, I think there were in fact three cases of people who knew they either had had tests, were awaiting the test, but became quite ill and didn't want to go to the government center in Yaba, or those who came suspecting they were ill and they denied having traveled to the UK or New York. Uh, and then we subsequently found out after that, we had to quarantine three of our nurses because of that. But I think it was the intense anger and the disappointment that how can patients really do that and put their lives at risk? We have tried, well, we have ensured that everybody that sees patients are appropriately protected. And we, I think really, once the lockdown is lifted, this virus is still going to be with us. And we will have to then assume, like we did during the, you know, the, 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 the peak of HIV, that assuming that every patient is potentially infected with COVID-19 and taking appropriate measures to prevent healthcare exposure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Toyin. And Toyin has asked, how do private hospitals address people who are sick with illnesses other than COVID-19. Um, and Toyin has said also that we see infected people going to private hospitals and the medical personnel there are not prepared. People are scared of going to these hospitals. I can only speak about my hospital. Uh, for which I am responsible. And what, there are a number of things we have done. We, took a, we made a lot of effort to reduce traffic such that only those people who really need to be physically seen in the hospital come to the hospital. A lot of the other patients, we see them through telemedicine and Medicine. teleconsultations. The repeat prescriptions are usually done online and patients then drive through to collect their drugs. So we had put all of those processes in place. However, we would still have patients who, uh, an isolation center cannot look after acute appendicitis. An isolation center cannot look after a pregnant woman who is in labor. So all of those people will still need to be in hospitals. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate at least the major hospitals are well prepared because I am on the platform of all the major CEOs of the private hospitals, at least on the island. And we work closely together to ensure that we build capacity and support each other. Um, uh, contrary to the rumors going around, I, private hospitals actually are not actively seeking to admit and keep COVID-19 patients. Some of them fell through the crack because they either misrepresented the facts and denied, you know, gave, didn't give appropriate history. Uh, and others have been people where we've had instances where the CT scan, for example, which is also pathognomonic of uh, COVID-19 infection, has been positive, overwhelmingly supportive of COVID-19, but the patient has tested negative. And therefore, reluctance by the state to initially admit such patients. We've had one or two of those simply to save their lives. And uh, we've done so, but because they are negative and persistently been negative, uh, really, one, they don't pose any risk of infection, and two, they needed to be treated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a lot of the questions that have been coming in from our uh, participants are uh, being grouped. They're more or less the same thing. So uh, some of them, quite a lot, a few of them are similar to what uh, Tsoyin have asked. I'd just like to ask a question that um, we mustn't leave children out of this discussion. And I'd like to pose two questions. One to um, Dr. Coker and another one to uh, Dr. Abody. For Dr. Coker, while discussing critical care, we must not forget that this pandemic is disruption 
has caused disruption of essential health care to both children and adults. Because of disruption to both travel and the supply chain, vaccinations have been postponed and put on hold. I work with diabetic children and we know that a lot of diabetics on insulin are now falling ill with poor uh, control and presenting with in the emergency room unconscious some with diabetic ketoacidosis so while we are ramping up critical care i think we also need to consider critical care in other areas will be needed apart from just for covid-19 and for dr um uh or your body the children are not going to school. And we know that schools or school is indeed an anchor for many children. And school routines are important coping mechanisms, particularly for children with mental health needs. Schools have been closed. Universities have been closed. Final year students are anxious. Final year university students are anxious. What's going to happen? Are they going to, after post COVID-19, is there going to be, are they going to be able to get jobs? So children are also at risk for long-term mental health issues. What may these issues be? And how can we help these children to navigate these uncertain times? Okay, should I go first? Yes, yeah, okay. thank you. Um, we, I think currently, because we have a lockdown and there is still a, a large capacity in the isolation centers, most, if not all, the COVID-19 patients are currently in the isolation centers. So most, both public and private hospitals are still uh, accessible to patients who are unwell and need to see the doctor. So it's still important that those people need to attend and be seen, uh, but it's also in equally important not to go to the hospital if you don't really have to because of the attendant risks thereof. So currently the capacity is there. The challenge will be if and when the system gets overwhelmed. Right. I mean, you saw in Italy where COVID-19 patients were completely uh, they had taken over all of the, virtually all the hospitals, and some of them were even in car parks with their IV infusions. When it gets to that level, unfortunately, I mean, no system, no health system in the world, not even New York, can cope with that. Uh, so that's one of the challenges we have, uh, but currently we can contain it. And I would advise people who are ill to still visit their doctors for healthcare. Um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. We still need to take a few other questions. Dr. Oyebadi, can we just, can you kindly answer your question in yeah, just a minute or two, please? Yeah, thank you. Regarding the schools, what has been done in some places is that children who are vulnerable, for example, in the UK, children who rely on schools for meals are still allowed to attend school. Children of key workers, healthcare workers, social workers, schools are open for them so that their parents can go and help and save the nation. So that's what I will advise about schooling that it might be a local arrangement, but some schools are open and some children can go to school. And some of them is not just for, it's to feed them because otherwise they cannot be fed. So that's what has happened here. You were talking about um, the effects on children. The psychological effects are essentially the same, but what one should bear in mind is that when children start to become mentally unwell, they manifest initially as behavioral problems. They will, might start to drink alcohol, may smoke, may become defiant, may become rude, and we will see that as bad behavior. It may be down the line that the symptoms of anxiety and depression that I've mentioned will come to the fore. So once a change in behavior should alert one to concerns. 
And it can also bear in mind that when children see their parents anxious, they themselves become anxious. Thank you. We have uh, 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 two questions that I'd just like to read out. One is from Olaolu. And Olaolu has, is asking, how do we manage the anxiety that comes with the uncertainty of when this will all end? Do we just live a day at a time? Or keep saving or planning? for a long, unpredictable time to come. However, taking it a day at a time seems like one is not facing reality. And then there's uh, another question that is coming, and I think if this for, uh, it is from Professor Wale Adebajo of the University of Sheffield. And this is uh, for Dr. Jimmy Coker. And he said, dear Jimmy, thank you for the excellent talk. How can the private medical sector in Nigeria better and further the Herculean efforts of government to combat COVID-19? So maybe we'll take Dr. Koka first, and then we'll go back to allow this question for Dr. Koka. Okay. okay, thank you very much. It's really nice to hear from Professor Adebajo, who is an old Egmont friend. Uh, most of the time we were in Sheffield, so nice to hear from him. The private sector has, con has been contributing significantly to the support against COVID-19. Um, and I would, there is the, I told you about the, the platform of the CEOs of the major hospitals, private hospitals in Lagos, where we discuss and collaborate. There has also been significant contribution uh, by the private sector uh, leaders, healthcare leaders, in creation of the Landmark Center. As you know, the Young Landmark Center was uh, the brainchild of YPO, a private organization. And one of the key people there is a, is a, is a medical director, uh, you know, the, the, sorry, the chairman of one of the large hospital groups. So the private hospitals have contributed. We, for example, I have seconded uh, at least six members of our staff to help support the landmark project. And I know that two or three other large private hospitals in Lagos have also contributed to the staff. At the moment, uh, we, the, the state feels that uh, you know, it can manage the numbers, uh, but there will, be, there will come a time. Uh, and the Commissioner of Health has indicated that private hospitals will need to be accredited so that the systems uh, are in place, particularly to protect staff. So the donning and dusting of the, doffing of the, you know, uh, the PPEs are properly done. There are safe and effective infection control measures in place and to ensure patient safety and also staff safety. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, maybe another question. Okay, Dr. Oyebodi, you ready? Yes. Thank you. Do, with regards to coping with the anxiety, I think that was the question. Yes. It's, first of all, as I said before, it is normal to feel anxious in this situation where we're all very stressed. If it's not severe, what you try and do is to try and distract yourself, perform those activities that you've been thinking of doing, tidy up your study, so that you're not sitting down and just thinking and ruminating all the time. Of course, when it becomes serious, you may want to consult somebody and seek advice. But by a lot, I'm sure most people will be able to deal with the anxiety over a period of time. The, that's the anxiety of dealing with the COVID. But the anxiety of dealing with the aftermath of COVID and your or one's livelihood, that's a very difficult one because no doubt some people are not going to be able to go back to the jobs they were doing. And they're going to be worried about their future. And that is understandable, understandable anxiety. If you find that you're finding it difficult to manage, you may have to seek some specific advice from your local doctor as to what you want to treat but please be careful about going straight into taking medication. There are many other ways of, um, 
or many other ways of dealing with anxiety. When you start taking medication, particularly anxiolytics, you're going down a path that you don't want to go. Thank you very much. We have a question from uh, Demola Alade Komo. And it reads thus, the infection rate is rising and going upwards daily. Are there projections on how far this may go? I guess this is for, for, for Nigeria. Do we know when the curve will be flattened? Considering the poverty level in Nigeria, social distancing, though we now call it physical distancing, seems to be a Western approach, which may not work in our plight. Coupled with the economic challenges being faced by the majority of Nigerians, should we not revisit lockdown? What hope do we have in the school of thought as past that BCG can lower the infection rates? So I, I think uh, this should go to uh, Dr. Uh, Koka. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Aladi Kamo. Um, as I explained at the beginning of my talk, the lockdown had a purpose. That purpose was to try as much as possible to reduce the 